Let's do, oh, there we go. <laughs> Great start. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to another episode of the Reading FC podcast. Um, today, it's just me, Mr. Courtney, today. Uh, Ryan is off playing football, so he's off to go and do that and relax, and then we will get his opinion on Thursday, Friday for you guys, about the game, as he got the score correct again. I swear, I swear that there's something, he's cheating somehow. You know, he knows something, doesn't he? He knows something we don't. <laughs> he's cheating somehow. I don't know how he's doing it, but he's cheating. But we will get his reaction and we'll get his reaction to the um, Birmingham game as well um, coming up this Wednesday. So, so today's episode, I will sort of talk through um, my experience. As you guys would have seen yesterday on the podcast, on the sports show, um, I released my first vlog, um, basically showing you what it is like to go to a uh, tier two uh, football ground. Um, and it is an experience that I think you have to do once um, because it's it's it, it's so different to what we're normally used to. It's, it is unbelievable. Um, I think the main one that I found was not the queues, but it was the queue going into the, into the turnstiles. It was so long and it goes so slowly because if, when you get a ticket, you get an A4 piece of paper that you have to print out or you have to, or they send to you, um, and you have to fold it. But no one was folding it before they got there, so they had to stand there while they were folding it, and then put the ticket in, and it's uh, long. Um, but you'll see that in there as well. Um, we're going to talk about the game today, uh, yesterday, game well, the game for you guys that was on Saturday. Um, a lot of talking points about that game from a great save from the Forest defender. Um, to prevent a goal. I have to say, I was reading through the Nottingham Forest comments about that, that red card, and they were saying, that's a better save than what Samba's ever done. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> but we will go through that, and we will build up to the Birmingham game coming up as well. We will get the score prediction as well from Courtney as well. But getting into it, how are you? How have you been? Very well, thank you, mate. Yourself? Yeah, I'm all good. I'm all good. Right, let's talk about Forest. Um, I think... The, the, the starting eleven, I think you couldn't get any more spot on if they tried. Um, Mate was back, come in for Samedo, exactly the same team as it was against um, Wednesday, but just with one change um, with Mate coming in. That was that's probably the best lineup we could have, barring Swift and maybe Yeardon. But Tom Holmes has definitely placed himself as number one right back at the moment. Yeah, he he was outstanding, and yeah, no, I think you're right. I think. Yeah, obviously Swift's out injured, but for the players they have available, for me, that is 100% the the best starting eleven they could have put out yesterday. Yeah. So let's talk about the first half. I think Reading controlled. I think that was the one thing that, when we watched it, so when you watch it on telly, for me in person was a heck of a lot different than watching it on telly because you can hear, it's like going to a Sunday league game. You can hear everything that's being said on the pitch. I mm. mean everything. And the one thing that I found the most was how much Liam Moore is shouts. That man does not stop controlling that team from the kickoff to the end of the game. And the one player he was hard on the whole way through that game was Josh Lauren. And I mean, he was on him every single second. And it got to a point where the Reading fans were going, Jesus Christ. <laughs> you could hear, because all you could hear was Liam go, Josh, left, now. Josh, back a bit. Josh, over to the right. And it was just Josh every three, so four seconds. Him just dictating what Josh was doing. And Laurent just went, okay, and did it. And I think, and you, it was the first time I experienced the wall where it was Lauren, um, Reno, uh, Morris, and Moore, them four compact together. And I tell you what, that is some combination. What was it like on telly for watching it? Yeah, um, yeah, just the, the, like you said, um, they're in control. Um, <clears throat> thought they were very. It's a t touch of fortune uh, not to go one nil down, which could have obviously completely changed the game. Um, but yeah, they like you said, it you know they they controlled the tempo and and they looked comfortable. I think the only thing in that in that first half is they had they had a couple of chances. Um, Mate had a 
absolutely golden chance to, to make it 2-0. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how he missed that. It wasn't. Um, but yeah, like, like you said, completely in control. And I mean, you know, having having the extra man was, was definitely a benefit. So watching the game, the only chance that I would say Forrest had, and I'm looking at the stats here, and they only had one shot on target. Um, they had two shots in total the whole game and only one was on target. Um, and I think that was the Lyle Taylor save um, that Raphael saved from the free kick um, in the first half. And I think that save just, and it went over the top and we watched it and it was next to my father-in-law who I was sat with. And he went over and we both went, cool, that's a great free kick. And he said, and Raphael pulled out. You could tell why Raphael's number one. And I know he's made a few mistakes, but that just showed he was on his feet, on his toes, and what a save that was. It was a great save. Yeah, a really good <clears throat> reaction save. Um, yeah, uh, I think it's one of those where you could see by by Taylor's face that he, he thought he scored as soon as as soon as he he made connection with it. Um, yeah, no, brilliant save. And obviously, we've been quite critical of him recently. Um, he has made some mistakes, but like you said, he. You know, he comes up with moments like that to to keep running in in the game. It was interesting as well. From the, let's talk about the penalty incident because I, I didn't really see it. I couldn't see it because the keeper was still in the way. But I saw something happen. So the corner comes in. I think it's Holmes that headers it. I think it's Holmes is the one that headers it, isn't it? That was going in. Or was it Holmes or was it Morrison? No, it's Morrison that headed it. And was it Morrison was, that headed it? I think because I was really hoping for Holmes to score because he had a few chances that he should have scored during that game. Mm. Um, and he headed it and it looped, it looped over the keeper, didn't it? And it was going in. But then all of a sudden, I just see the defender just fall into the net and everyone shout penalty. And I was like, I didn't see that. But then I just went penalty because everyone else was. The keeper, it didn't loop over the keeper. The keeper dropped it. Oh, was it? did he drop it? The keeper dropped it. He, he should have punched it. He tried to catch it, dropped it. And then it sort of Holmes came off Holmes's head, went towards goal, and and then Matey decided to uh, turn into second goalkeeper. And <laughs> it was a good save, though. Well, it was a good save, yeah. Claw it off the line, but yeah, definite, definite penalty. But yeah, it was. I don't think they'll be very forgiving of their keeper because it was. I don't know what he was doing. All he had to do was was clear the ball, but he, he came out, tried to catch it, and got it all wrong. He's very well known, Sandor, as well, because he made the. Um mistake last season at the Medeski for the 97th minute own yeah. goal because he and then he then made the same sort of mistake when Reading went there away in January as well so he's he made a few mistakes, especially mistake. against Reading yeah he does have a mistake in him but also you can talk about goalkeeping mistakes if you like but I think you also have to give credit to Tom Holmes um because he had the you know the desire he, he used his body you know he got himself in there Chased the ball, um, and yeah, it was played a you know a really important part in in getting that penalty. Excellent penalty by Lucas Joel carries on with his tally of only not scoring in three games. I think it is this season so far. Yeah, to the season so far, so what are we now December, so it's, it's not bad going. I mean, you think he's going to get well at least twenty? He's only got six more to go. Um, so yeah, it's been an amazing season, and you could tell. He was, you know, his confidence as well, the way he took the penalty. He was, yeah, never in doubt that he was going to score. Um, yeah. yeah, he's a he's a man, man on fire, and yeah, he deserves it. He, it was it was very it was cool to see a celebration as well in person. Mm-hmm. Someone scoring, I think, because when he scored, he ran straight over um, to the area where we were. Well, I wasn't. I was near the halfway line um, where I was sat, and. Um, he, he comes straight over, and you could just see the joy of the players of having fans yeah. back in there as well. Um, and it was, just, and, and and I remember after twenty minutes, half an hour, a, a part of the Reading area was chanting for Paunovic to give him a wave, but I don't think it was. <laughs> I, saw that. I saw that on the telly. I think someone had to remind him. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that was the second time in the second half. So someone he must have we went they went five minutes straight out of the second half to get him to wave because they were in love with him at that point. Um, but the first half he was saying it and then he booed and he just carried <laughs> on. But you and the one thing I took away from the game as well that really caught my eye is how much Paunovic talks to his bench. 
he is constant. Like if I watch, if you watch any other manager, they stand at the the edge of the technical area and they think about them themselves and every so often go back to the bench, go and sit down, have a think about it, talk to some of the coaches and then go back to the touchline where Paunovic is stood at the front. He'll go back for 10 minutes, talk to each each of them, mm. five, 10 minutes, each of them, get all of their ideas of what they think, go through scenarios and stuff like that. Then he'll go out and he will shout. I mean, we could hear him. Um, he's very vocal and he's very, he very much, I wouldn't say he very much is very punctual to the mm. point where he just says it and he's like, you've got to do this, you move it. At one point, I think in the second half, was um, Forrest had a corner and the players were very slow to come out um, of that corner and he, you could hear him yelling up, up and then Moore went, oh shit, okay, up, 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 up and then Moore then took over the shouting and then did it and that was the one thing that that impressed me a lot was when I've seen, football, like we've read in managers before with Gomez, it was his assistant would just always get booked for shouting or doing something but he would talk sometimes to his bench Bowen was every so often would talk to Eddie um, and yeah. John, John O'Shea, but him he talked to everyone. Yeah, and then he talked to players about and before they went on, they you know with the normal assistant goes over with like this folder and goes yeah. through things. He stands next to the assistant and the player and goes through it with them, so everyone's on the same page. And I thought that little inch of detail really impressed me a lot, and that I thought that was amazing. Then you know, the only other. Yeah, I say the other thing we probably need to talk about is uh, is Michael Elise talking of uh, inches of detail and and mm. being impressed. <laughs> I've seen. I, I was I was very impressed with John Swift with his passing and with his range of passing, but Elise, the the skill for some of his passes to slip some people through just amazed me it was like uh, there were certain points where I think there was Jal running in over there and then he just slotted across to Reno or something like that and I went oh okay that's good that's very good um, yeah, he, he, he makes the game look easy um, it's, it's good and good and bad for Reading it's good in the fact that you know we get to see you know watch this sort of young player you know flourish and, and grow um, bad news is I'll put my house that he's not on red, at Reading next season because mm -hmm. I, I really, I really can't see it if he <clears throat> if he keeps sort of developing the way the way he is at the moment. Like I said, he, he just makes the game look easy, and you know we we lost Sigurdsson after a season um, yeah. when he when he broke through. I, for me personally, Elise is leaps and bounds ahead of oh, they're they're different different players. Sigurdsson was more of a <clears throat> sort of a goal scoring midfielder, wasn't he? Like more mm -hmm. of a Frank of Lampard Frank type. Lampard -esque type. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they, you, it's unfair to compare them in that way. But I think if you look at where Elise is now compared to where Sigurdsson was at that age, mm -hmm. I think Elise is leaps and bounds ahead of him. Um, if I was Dayongi, I'd be sitting down with Elise uh, with a blank checkbook and telling him to write his numbers down. Because the, I'm not sure how long he's got left on his deal, but eighteen months, I think. Yeah, I mean, the, the longer they can, if they can get him to tie down a new deal, all that means is that they can get more money for him. Um, yeah, I think I think there's eighteen months, and I, and it's the same for Omar. Uh, Omar Richards has got till the end of the season. Um, another one that they really need to yeah get on with. I think I think I saw as well as well that they were saying that people were saying that if. <laughs> Um, by the start of January, that Omar Richards doesn't sign a new deal, Reading will be looking to sell him in January. Um, but no club will pay it because Ego runs at the end of the contract, so they get him on the free. Exactly. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a, a really dangerous game to play. Um, I'd be very surprised if if they went down that route. Mm. That I know there have been talks with him. Um, I, I'm not sure what the hold-up is. It, a deal has been offered. I'm not sure if it's financial or, or if he's waiting to, you know, waiting for options. I think in these sorts of situations, when it's it's a bit it's a strange one because Richards has been a he's been a de a decent player, but in my opinion, he hasn't been a a standout player up until now. Mm -hmm. 
where he's been absolutely fantastic. And then you get, you know, a situation where he's playing out of his skin. There are, you know, clubs are looking at him and his agents ears now have probably pricked up and thought, oh, hang on, I could probably make a bit of money here. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, hopefully, <clears throat> hopefully he signs that deal. But, yeah, we'll have to wait and see. It'd be interesting because I watched him yesterday and especially for the first time in person since the, since I think he's had his proper breakout mm. breakout season so far. And he makes things look so effortless at times. Um, he needs to improve his crossing um, sometimes, but I think his work rate um, and his attitude with defending as well, his attitude with defending is 40 times better than what it was before. Um, but that also is as well that Liam Moore is also in his ear majority of the time as well. And I just couldn't get over how much Moore controls that team. Um, because I think the first time we've really been able to hear yeah. what goes on on that pitch. Um, and he really turned into someone that I was like, do you know what? He's one of those that would m- make you make you pissed off at him like oh, fuck off like that but then you go right I need to prove it to him and then you do it and then he goes uh, but then you can see as well he puts an arm over your shoulder and gets you going as well it's it's just him and Mor- Mor- Morrison and Moore have the best partnership in my eyes because Morrison doesn't do a lot of talking um he's very much he concentrates on the game and he does a little bit of talking here and there where Moore is just all the time but that I mean that's Moore's role he is he's the captain he's yeah He's a skipper. He's the leader. So you know, it's it's good that he does that because that's what he needs to do. Um, but yeah, obviously, it's yeah. I, I didn't hear it myself, but I, I can I can imagine it. Um, I want to free kicks and corners. I think it was Jaria that did the corner for Morris's goal, if I'm correct. But the the one criticism I have is beating the first man. Oh, don't get me started on this. G, how how I, a professional footballer? Cannot beat the first man of it. I, it's what there there are many mysteries in the world. Yeah. And that is one of them. I, I've never understood it. No, and that was one of my annoyance from yesterday. Was watching Reading was at least they would do it would over hit it or he would under hit it, and then Ajaria went on it, and then he does a peach of a corner, and that was beautiful corner, beautiful <laughs> header um, for the goal. But then the next corner or the next free kick, they can't beat the first man. It's like, if I'm a coach, I'm going, right, all you need to do is I don't care about whippage. I don't care about how curling it. Beat the first man and see what happens because you never know what could happen. If you beat the first man, it could go anywhere, especially with that goalkeeper could probably flap it in himself. But <laughs> but it was jar. And the other thing I think we found of was when teams go defensive, Reading really str- struggled to break them down. Um, I think the Sheffield Wednesday game was definitely the key. They had a man sent off and then we struggled. Yeah. And then when Nottingham Forest went down to 10, um, we struggled there where they literally had 10 men behind the ball at the majority of the game as well. Um, you say that though, but it's not as if they didn't create chances. It's more the fact no. they didn't finish him. I yeah. go back to that, you know, that Mate chance. I mean, gee, I mean, I would have put it on target. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so you know they they did they you know they could easily have been two or three goals up in that first half and then you know they would have been home and home so they, they did sort of make it difficult for themselves in that respect and it was I don't know I don't know what you thought on the when you were watching it but really mm. enjoyable football to watch Reading is mm. um the way they control possessions we had 68 percent possession um in the game against Forest and we just seemed to Forest didn't look like they were going to do anything at all. And we looked like we were just very comfortable to have the ball pass it around, get everyone to have a bit of a touch um, and just sort of control the game. What was it like watching it? Yeah, I don't know. I, I like Chris Uton. He's, he's a great manager. And I know they were down to 10 men, but <clears throat> I was very underwhelmed by Nottingham Forest. So like you said, mm. this, yeah, they, they, they offered very little for 90 minutes. Um, I, know, I know they were down to 10 men, so obviously that, you know, that does make it difficult. But I mean, I, I've seen many teams go down to 10 men and, and still play well, still, you know, still get a goal. Um, 
but yeah, they they really didn't look like threatening Reading at all for yeah, like you said, 70, 80 minutes of the game, however long um, they were down to ten men. I don't know whether you saw it that much on the telly, but did you see Sam Bulldog's throwing? No, I saw him like. <laughs> yeah. It was the best comedy moment I have ever witnessed in my life. Okay, one of the funniest at a Reading game I've ever witnessed. So it clearly goes off a Reading player for a not on a forest throw in. But Sam runs towards the ball, picks the ball up, and throws it down the line. And the referee's blown his whistle, going, and he went, What? Because he's just wasting time. He did it purposely to waste time. And he looked at the referee and went, I thought it was our throw in. And he really comically done it. And you could see some of the Reading players around the back laughing because they knew what he was doing. And he looks like a, a very, very good character, but I don't think he will stay any much longer um, but i think that that's like that's his experience isn't it um yeah it was the same for <laughs> he, he, he's an experienced player and i was thinking he knows how to play the game he's always been a clever footballer sam baldock it was the same for when he came on against shepherd wednesday that that was never a penalty the the, the one on him but he, he knew exactly what he was doing um so yeah no he, he he's a clever player he, he knows how to play the game and He's a nice guy, Sam Bulldog. It, it just it hasn't worked out for him really at Reading, and yeah, I think to be honest, he's probably looking forward to to getting out of it. <laughs> I heard a story. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna say who it was from, but it was on Twitter. Um, and the Reading players went to this school, um, and they were talking. Um, and <laughs> this is a funny story about Sam Bulldog. And apparently, they asked some of the um, players and the kids. Who's the best player in the world? Messi, Ronaldo, all of that. And Sam Bulldog turned around and goes, me. Oh. He goes, yeah. I am. And he goes, if I can't say myself, I'm not answering. And he just didn't answer the question. <laughs> no, that's true. I've seen it. <laughs> I was like, amazing. <laughs> I was like, that is absolutely amazing. Um, so in, in total, I think we can all agree that it was a, after the Sheffield Wednesday game, Let's get your thoughts on the Sheffield Wednesday game because I know that we had a big rant on the Instagram Live um, and on Twitter. And I know you come and joined us on the Instagram Live. So thank you ever so much for coming on. Um, and you had a go at me for having a go about Man United, but still. <laughs> um, what did you think of that game? It just, yeah, just, just in disbelief, really. I think it's, <clears throat> as anyone would, so I always try and be balanced and sort of sit on the fence. But. I think there are times where you just have to say, actually, that was an abomination um, in terms of the referee. Because you've always said, and you've um, always said, haven't you, about the EFL referees, how yeah. much of a different standard they are to the compared to the Premier League. Awful. And to to be fair, I mean, you you can talk about the referees as much as you want. Reading, again, had four or five yeah. clear-cut opportunities, and, and and that's on them. That that You, know, you can't blame the referee if... You know your strikers or your mid attacking midfielders aren't gonna, you know, aren't gonna take the chances that are presented to them. You're you're sort of setting yourself up for for failure. I mean, obviously, they, in hindsight, they got a point, and it's not not the worst result in the world. But I mean, they definitely the the first one was absolutely clear cut. Uh, the second one as well, I thought was a penalty. The, the the other two, the one on Bulldog, I didn't think it was a penalty. I thought it was clever. I just thought he knew exactly what he was doing. And the Laurent one, it was six of one and a half dozen the other. Mm-hmm. He had hold of his shirt. The defender had hold of Laurent's shirt. It was, I, I can't see how you can give a penalty for that. But certainly the first the first two, it was the one on Richards and the one on... And the handball. The handball. Oh, the, Jesus, I mean, I think I said on Twitter, I'd be asking him for the lottery numbers. <laughs> <laughs> no idea how he's gotten away with that. Um, just hope now that it doesn't get to a point later down the season where Reading desperately need two points mm-hmm. uh, because that could come back to bite them on the backside. But then again, like I said, well, you, you need to finish the chances. Yeah, and it, you can you can complain about the referee all you like, but at the end of the day, they had they had opportunities to kill that game off, um, and, and that and that's on them. So let's let's go on. Let's move on to Birmingham. That's coming up Wednesday, um, seven forty-five kickoff at the Medeski. Fans will all be allowed back in as well um, for that game as well. 
so let's talk about that. So let's talk about Birmingham. So their previous six games is they lost to Bournemouth 3-1. They then drew against Coventry, drew against Luton, drew against Millwall, lost against Barnsley. But yesterday they beat Bristol City 2-0. Um, let's talk about um, our head-to-head against them. So Reading have beaten them 14 times, um, drew against them 12 and lost against them 15 times. Um, the last fixture that Reading played against them was the very last fixture before uh, fans weren't allowed in, um, where Pele scored the last minute, I think it was the 80-something minute goal, um, where we beat them 3-1 at Birmingham. We've got a st- st- staggering record against them over the past five fixtures, six fixtures. A last draw, lost win. Um, so it goes all over the place. Um, the Birmingham City manager is Ankel Kranka. Um, he has faced Reading eight times, um, which is the second most team he's faced in his career. Um, he's beaten Reading three times. He's drew against them twice and lost against them three times. Um, so a bit of a staggering record there. The even sort of head-to-head, isn't it? The, yeah. <clears throat> the numbers are very, very even. So at the moment, Birmingham are sitting 16th um, in the league. Um, play 16, won four, drawn seven, lost five with a minus two goal difference. Um, they had all that money from Judd Bellingham. They spent and got a lot of players in, a lot of free players um, this season. Reading at the moment, our third. Um, one nine, drawn three, lost four. Goal difference of plus seven um, on 30. We are one point off Norwich, who are top. Um, but we are also three points from Bristol City in eighth. So... <laughs> <laughs> It's very, it's very tight up there. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, the, these games are, are important now because <clears throat> Reading obviously wants to be challenging it in, in the top six. <clears throat> um, with the greatest respects to Birmingham, who are a good team, they haven't, they haven't had a good start to the season. They're like you said, down in you know seventeenth, eighteenth. But these are the games where Reading need to be ruthless. They need to be clinical, especially at home. Um, <clears throat> they need to use the advantage they'll get from the fans. I know it's only two thousand, but. 2,000 people can still make a lot of noise and, and give you a lift. Um, and yeah, this is a, it's, it's a must-win game. Um, like you said, they're only, only one point off Norwich, but only three points above eighth. So they need to keep in and around the pack. Um, if they drop points, you can guarantee the others won't because it's sod's law. Um, it's just the way football works. So yeah, it's a really big game for them. I can't... Can't see them making too many changes. I was um, going to ask, do you think they're going to make any changes for this game? I can't see it, um, barring any any knocks or, or injuries. Um, I wouldn't have thought you know, he'll make any changes at all, to be honest. Um, no, I think if he can, he'll go go with the same 11 and yeah, that, that would be the right decision for me. I think as well, the, the, uh, the man management on mm. the Forest game, when we were 2 know up, controlling the game, and he just took everyone... Um, Elise, Jao, Mate, Ijari. I think he took all of the really the players that we need to look after um, very much. So he took them off to rest them. Mate didn't like it so much. Um, mm. Fans really let him know that they didn't like him, but he made it up at the end where he came over and clapped everyone. Um, and that was the one thing I wanted to say as well um, on here before we go on was at the end of the game when every single coaching member of this team, every single player, um, even ones that uh, I think that Onan um, that we signed for Brentford come over and was very much, he seems to be very much part of the team because everyone was going over to him, clapping, and he come over and did everything. I think Jao was around as well. Um, it was very much, it felt like a special moment because you could tell that Palmovic, Palmovic is very much a showman. And I think we worked that out when he come over to the fans because he clapped us and then he went and he did like a Jurgen Klopp. He went around, hugged all of his players, made sure they were all right, did everything, turned around and he was like fist pumping and doing all of that. And all the fans are going, yes, come on, and getting more excited every time. And you could really tell he's very much a manager for the fans. And you could tell that if it's not something's not going right, he will turn around and go and do the, all the Jurgen stuff and do all of that. And, and the, the, as I was saying to you before we recorded, when we were chanting his name, in the second, in the first half, he didn't do it and he got booed um, for not doing it. And the second half, they were going five minutes straight and he walked back to his bench and someone must have said something to him <laughs> on the bench because then he turned around and gone. <laughs> and then he, everyone loved him then at that point. 
But so, OK, let's so let's go with score prediction. What do you think the score prediction will be against Birmingham this Wednesday? I need to beat Ryan, don't I? Um, you do. Has Ryan done it yet? No. Hmm. Score prediction. Three. Ooh. One. Oh, okay. I'm going to go two nil. I'm going to go two nil. I think I think Birmingham won't trouble us too much. I say that now. You watch what happens. Um, but I feel like our defence, after what I, I was so impressed with our defence, um, I know they didn't really do anything or much for us, but at the same time, they controlled what was given to them. Um, so for me, 2 0. But yes, that's it. Thank you ever so much for coming up. Don't forget to go and watch our vlog. Um, very first time me ever editing something like that, and it took mm. me so long because I was didn't like bits, and then I liked bits, and I didn't like, and then I was just, I was like, right, I just need to just do it. Um, so it will be with you guys, uh, yesterday. Um, at 12 uh, we'll be there forever but it's on the red and fc playlist um on on the page as well um and if you're listening to this unfortunately i can't do audio of it because it just would just sound utter crap um so what i've done is so if you guys want to go over to our youtube channel go and give it a watch um and then we and then just give us some feedback as well what you guys thought of it what you think tell me if there's any ways that i can improve what i do um there's certain bits when my thumb <laughs> makes an entrance into the camera <laughs> but I didn't want to get rid of the footage because I really like the certain bits of the way it looked so thank you guys very much for, thank you Mr Friday for turning up um, and we will hopefully see you next Sunday uh, or Monday for you guys and 